Hope has arrived. A weary world can rejoice. Can we rejoice today? Clap your hands and say amen. That's awesome. Well, welcome to Christmas weekend at Providence City Church. If you take out your Bibles with me, or your phones, or your devices, turn to the book of Matthew. If this is your first time with us, or you're visiting, warm welcome to you and your family this morning. Pray that you'll be refreshed and encouraged as we worship God through song, through the study of His Word, and the power of His Spirit that is moving among our fellowship. It's our pleasure to share this time with you today. Over the course of this weekend, beginning on Friday evening, yeah, Trent, that was a little TMI right there. That's all right, no, no problems. We let grace abound in this place. We've been uh, considering some of the most essential characters involved in the Christmas narrative and what their lives reveal to us, not only about the gospel, not only about God, but our relationship with Him. And so after looking very briefly at Mary's life on Friday evening and her season of trial that she had to endure while carrying baby Jesus, we concluded with this magnificent truth to carry us through the festive season, which is this, that the presence of God far outweighs the provision of his hand. Can someone say amen this morning? At the source of Mary's favor through those difficult festivities that she was going through wasn't in what is, what could be, what should be, what would have been if her plan went according to what she wanted. Mary found favor in the knowledge that she had found something far greater and far more enduring than momentary comfort and momentary pleasure. That she found in Jesus an in intimate relationship with God. Isn't that glorious news over this Christmas season? And one other thing, Lindsay was showing me a post. Crystal, I'm glad that you're in here about that fantastic Christmas song. Mary, did you know that you're... And as we read this right here, greeting, this is the angel speaking to Mary. For you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He'll be great. He'll reign over the throne of David and over the house of Jacob and his kingdom will have no end. Mary, did you know yeah, she knew. You can stop playing that song. Everyone say amen today. <laughs> All right. Today we're gonna look a little at a further element of that relationship with the Lord by examining Joseph's experience of the Christmas narrative. And I pray that through these truths that God would become more real and personal and intimate with you than ever before. The concept I want us to consider this morning is the following. Is that following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. Following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. You know, for many people, their relationship with God can play out in a similar fashion to a white elephant gift exchange. Anyone do white elephant gift exchange this Christmas? Good. Where? On the outside, the gift has the perfect wrapping paper, the weight feels good, the size looks inviting, but when you open it and begin to see what it's about, you start to realize that this wasn't what you anticipated at all. This is so not what you wanted. What you wanted was a Starbucks gift card. Wrapped in a box, oh, thank goodness, this is a Target gift card. But instead, you ended up with a Richard Simmons 1986 VHS workout special of a grown man doing star, jump in, star jumps in youth size shorts loaned from Randy Oakley. <laughs> That's so not what you wanted. You know, and in similar fashion, that's how many people's journey with God plays out. Where is he? There, wow, man. Praise Jesus. Glory. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Super sweating, aerobic workout. Mm. In a similar fashion, that's how many people's journey with God plays out. Obviously not with the shorts. Get that shorts out of your brain right now. But you start your journey with Jesus, everything is incredible. Every song you hear speaks to your soul. Every prayer time is like Pentecost. Every movie moves you to some kind of facet of the gospel. And then guess what? Life happens, right? Trials emerge. Opposition arises. Spiritual apathy takes root as the newness fades away behind the numbness of daily routine. And that inevitable doubt begins to creep into your mind that perhaps God's definition of the abundant life isn't exactly what you had in mind. Anyone been there before? 
Today, I want to provide you some clarity into that aspect or dynamic of our relationship with Jesus and then close with giving you two truths that hopefully will inspire you and give you great confidence as you continue to walk with your Savior, Savior day by day. And so let's turn to the book of Matthew. We're gonna begin in verse one. We'll read from verse one to eight, uh, verse 18 to 25 this morning as we consider following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. Everyone there? Say amen. Amen, all right. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged or betrothed to Joseph, after that, it was then discovered before they came together that she was pregnant and apparently from the Holy Spirit. And so her husband Joseph, being a righteous, a good, a just man, and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, well, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins, verse 22. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, got his Starbucks, kind of amazed at the night's developments, he then did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married Mary and did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Let's pray as we consider following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. God, as we come to sit under your word once again, as we prayed on Friday, we pray that you would remove the distractions from the season, who we're going to eat with this afternoon, what the schedule is like on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. God, would you take that busyness and just shift it aside for a second, God, and help us to rest in the true treasure of the season, God? Would you help us to hear from you this morning? God, we need to be filled by you. And God, we need it more than ever before over Christmas. God, I confess that it's been busy. And I'm weary and I'm tired, God, and would you help me to preach now your word and help us all, God, to hear clearly from your voice. Glorify your name by saving, by changing, by revealing who you are, God, please. And then by using a weak vessel like me to give you glory. It's in your name I pray. Everybody said amen, amen. All right, point number one for us today is this. So walking with God will require radical obedience. Walking with God will require radical obedience. And here's the caveat. Even in seasons when nothing makes sense. Easy to follow Jesus when everything's going your way. But walking with God is gonna require radical obedience even when nothing makes sense. Verse 18 said the following. The birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged or betrothed to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant and apparently from the Holy Spirit. And so her husband Joseph, drastically confused and devastated, but being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. Notice, they were engaged and they needed to get what? Divorced, right? What's up with that? I'll get to that in just a second. See, at this moment in time, nothing would have made sense to Joseph. A young man, 16, 17 years old, a carpenter, a mason by trade, 
just a poor, humble, hardworking guy who desired nothing more than to honor God, love others, and make a humble living when one day his entire world gets turned completely upside down. Don't know if anyone's been through an experience like that before, anybody. When one moment your life seems to be on cruise control, you know, you're just going down, life is a highway. You're cruising down the interstate, windows down, you've got those trip essentials. Listen, whenever I travel with Lindsay, I've got to stop at a gas station and get one of these. I don't know why I've got like a vice in my life. You can pray for me. Needless to say, you're going down the highway of life when suddenly the framework of your life seems to be dismantling around you. Nothing seems to make sense. There seems to be no end at sight, no solution at hand to change the situation. And listen, you live long enough and you'll go through a situation like this, right? This is exactly where Joseph was. One moment preparing for his happily ever after with his bay or with his baby. To suddenly figuring out that the girl that he was betrothed or engaged to, his righteous, holy, loving, kind bride to be Mary, was pregnant and the child definitely wasn't his. I know that that's not mine. And to make matters worse, Mary is providing the most insane excuse and explanation imaginable, saying that the child in her womb is divinely conceived by the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that conversation for a second? Joseph, oh baby, I'm sorry. I'm pregnant. Jesus did it. That explanation has got to be on par with those cliche Christian breakup lines. Susan, baby, it's over. I've fasted three days. I've read through Zephaniah 16 times. God affirmed in my spirit, got this vision in a dream. Waterfalls, rainbows, polar bears. You weren't there, so it's over, baby. Insane explanation, right? If you've used that breakup line before, we'll pray for you after the service. You can meet me back. And even putting aside the confusion of that statement, just the breaking of the betrothal agreement alone would have been devastating enough for Joseph because betrothal was completely different to the engagements that we see in today's society, right? Today, you know, you have a sentimental date, create a romantic atmosphere, the usual flowers, chocolates, attempt to formulate a meaningful speech in your mind, get on a knee and pop the question, and hopefully begin the delightful process of planning the wedding. Contact Crystal Curtain if you need some help with that. I'll never forget Lindsay and I drive to our engagement. Lindsay had absolutely no idea what was going on. Praise be to God for that. Weather was perfect clear sky, starry night, headed to the site of our first date where I absolutely froze to death as we stargazed. Needless to say, getting close to the location, I turn on the radio. I couldn't have scripted this any better. Billy Joel is on the radio. I love you just the way you are. Glances of affection, you know, soaking up the moment, like nailing it like 120% right here. And just, literally, just as we were about to pull into the location, I'm talking like 400, 500 yards away, Lindsay gets tired of the song that is playing. And before I could stop her, she skips to the next track. And suddenly, from just the way we are, going into the location, we're riding into the spot, listening to, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world was turning. <laughs> Complete bus kill. <laughs> Thankfully, she said yes. I didn't drop the ring into the lagoon, praise God. And now we're swiftly headed towards our seventh anniversary. Can we clap for Lindsay today? <clears throat> Needless to say, betrothal was completely different to said engagements. Betrothal was the first stage of marriage in those days. Covenant stage. A big deal. Two families actually wrote up a binding contract. And if at any time during that contract period, one violated the marriage vow or found to be pregnant, you would have to be divorced in an official sense. In fact, legally, one could have the woman stoned if she was found to be unfaithful. That's how serious of an offense this was. Just to give you an accurate picture of what was happening, when Mary told Joseph she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, They were in essence legally married, Deuteronomy 20 verse seven. And suddenly all their plans for their happily ever after began to dismantle before them. 
But despite the brokenheartedness, the confusion, the devastation, Joseph chose to continue to honor and obey God and to divorce Mary quietly because he loved her and he loved his God. You see, many of us tend to forget that choosing to follow Jesus means choosing to trust him in seasons of comfort and in seasons of confusion. God, I have absolutely no idea what is going on in my life right now. Has anyone had a 2018 like that? Anybody? God, I don't know what is going on right now. I'm devastated, I'm weak, I'm weary, I am tired, God. Nothing seems to make sense. My marriage seems to be falling apart. Everything we've worked on seems to be dismantling. But God, instead of giving up and walking away, I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna choose to follow you and obey you in seasons of comfort and confusion. God, my parents, my spouse, my children, my friends, their health seems to be deteriorating. But God, I trust you. I know it's not my calling to fix every dilemma, but I'm gonna follow you faithfully. God, I've got this calling, this stirring on my life to do something out of the box, out of my comfort zone, and it's so not like me, but I'm gonna choose to trust you. I'm gonna continue to follow you because I'm beginning to understand now that walking with you is not a guarantee of comfort. It's a call to radical obedience, even in seasons when nothing seems to make sense. A.W. Tozer put it wonderfully, he put it like this. The Christian is like a man who has learned to drive in a country where the traffic moves on the left-hand side of the highway and suddenly finds himself in another country and forced to drive on the right. He must unlearn his old habit and learn a new one. And more serious than all, he must learn in heavy traffic. And so my question to you this morning, do you find yourself in a spiritual season of heavy traffic this Christmas? Be encouraged by the word of God this morning. Because walking with God will require radical obedience even in seasons when nothing seems to make sense. Vance Havner put it this way, I loved it. He said, our Lord has made discipleship hard and startled many prospective followers because he called them to a pilgrimage, not a parade, to a fight, not a frolic. Walking with God will require radical obedience. Obedience, say amen today. Secondly, I love that God doesn't leave Joseph in that confusion and in that dilemma alone. He shows them, but point number two for us today is this, that walking with God will reveal his radical faithfulness. That adversity is not an indicator of God's absence. In fact, God has a tendency, can I get a witness today, that God has a tendency of showing up in the midst of adversity. Verse 20 said the following, but after he had considered, Joseph had considered these things, thinking about what in the world is going on, Mary's pregnancy, how's this gonna play out as he was wrestling with these difficult things. Behold, some translations say, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, give him the name Jesus because he's gonna save his people for their sins. I would have said to Gabriel, hey, hey, dude, just hold up a second. That would have been great to know a couple of months earlier. Why didn't you come? Didn't you mess up the timing, dude? Why are you telling me this now? And so let me give you two observations here as we begin to land this plane. One about God's timing and the other about God's tendency, okay? First one about God's timing. Let me just pose the question. Why didn't God do this earlier? Why did God delay? One thing we know from the course of Scripture is that our God is intentional, right? He doesn't operate in coincidence or happenstance. He knows the beginning from the end, right? That he is intentional. And so why did he wait for Joseph to endure this season and then send an angel to bring explanation and clarity and peace to this problem? Because surely... He could have spared Joseph a whole bunch of hurt, confusion, anxiety, stress, sleepless nights if he hadn't but delayed. Why did God wait? Have you thought about that? Why? And I want to propose to you this morning that while Joseph was wrestling, that while he was waiting, 
that while he was worrying, God wasn't absent, God wasn't distracted, and God wasn't preoccupied with another endeavor. In fact, while Joseph waited and worried and wrestled, God was working. Or in other words, God had a purpose and a plan for that specific season and that specific situation. How do we know that? Romans 8.28, right? For God works all things together for the good. All things, the worrying and the wonderful seasons. God works all things together for the good who love him and are called according to his purpose. And you know, maybe, just maybe, That's where you find yourself this Christmas season, in a season of waiting and wrestling and worrying. Waiting on God to give you direction on your career. Waiting on God to bring you a godly spouse. Waiting on God to heal the wounds of a broken marriage or friendship or experience. Waiting on God to move in your kid's life. Waiting on God to repair the wounds of a sinful decision you made yesteryear. But let this text encourage you this morning. As I've said this before, don't despise God's delays. Don't despise God's delays because a season of waiting is not a sign that God has wandered away from the purpose and plan of your life. Like here in this narrative, just because the angel hadn't appeared yet didn't mean God wasn't faithfully at work preparing the greatest purpose for Joseph to be the father of the Most High God. God prepared Joseph to be the dad of Jesus in the time of wrestling. And what is God preparing for you in your time of wrestling? His great and mighty plan for your life. While you are waiting, know that God is working. Can I give personal testimony very quickly? Personally, from my own walk with Jesus, I've found that it's in God's delays that I've learned the most about being faithful. It's in the delays that I've learned the most about trusting in God's leading and sovereignty in my life. It's in the delays that I've learned the most about treasuring his presence more than the provision of his hand. And in hindsight, I know in the moment this is difficult, but in hindsight, when I look back at my journey with Jesus thus far, I don't despise his delays. I praise him for the periods of waiting which he used to develop my faith, develop my affection and my longing and my dependence and trust on him. And so my humble encouragement this morning, I know this is hard. Instead of getting frustrated in the details of the delay, why not give those to God and work on worshiping in the waiting? Don't despise God's delays. Because it's during the delays that he might be just doing his greatest work in you. And then secondly, and I love this part, very briefly, don't miss that God has a tendency of showing up in your suffering. Anybody been like that before? That as Joseph was wrestling with the hurt and the pain and what happened and what lay ahead, so God showed up in the middle of his mess. And you know, here's what's so fascinating to me about God showing up. A lot of times when we're praying, God, I'm going through a difficult season. Would you please, would you please help me right now? You know, I don't know if you've been here before, where God doesn't suddenly just fix the problem, but instead does something greater. He increases our sense of intimacy with him. I'm reminded of that account of Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego in Daniel chapter three. Do you remember that? where they were thrown into the fire, right? As they stood in the midst of those flames, God didn't put out the flames, did he? He didn't put out the flames. What did he do? He put Jesus in there with them. As I've heard it put before, it's not about God putting out our fires. It's about who's in there with you. Woo, that gave me goosebumps just thinking about that. Walking with God is going to reveal his radical faithfulness. Psalm 23 verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Not because you're going to eradicate the valley, but why? Because 
Yeah, you're with me there. Your rod and your staff and your presence, they comfort me. Are you standing in the midst of a fire this season? Well, during this fire, you know what you will find, that there is someone standing with you right there. And maybe he's even going to use that fire to refine you for heaven. Walking with God will reveal his radical faithfulness. And as we close today, I wanted to show you that sometimes God doesn't remove our adversity, but rather increases our sense of intimacy with him. And lastly today, I wanted to give you these two wonderful truths given to Joseph, and I pray will fuel your walk with God as you faithfully follow him. And it says that as you walk with him, you walk with a powerful promise keeper. And as you walk with him, you walk with a powerful promised Messiah. I'm reminded of the illustration when we go to uh, the mall with our girls. You know, they don't mind going to the mall and walking in the mall with us. But you know what they do suddenly when there's a big crowd? You know what they do to gain confidence in their walk through the mall? They run up to mommy and daddy and, and you know they do? They're this, can I walk with you? And it gives them confidence to know who they're walking with, Right? As you walk, you walk with a powerful promise keeper. And as you walk, you walk with a powerful promised Messiah. You see, the angel of the Lord concludes by saying the following to Joseph, that all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, that the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You know, maybe today, maybe you've lived your entire life with parents, people, co-workers, who've continually let you down because they didn't hold fast to their word. They didn't fulfill their promises that they had spoken. But that's not like the one who has promised to walk with you faithfully. God has never broken his promise to you. He has never failed to deliver on his word. He is the powerful promise keeper. And this text is the validation of that truth. As the angel refers to a miraculous sign of the virgin birth taking place that was promised all the way back in Isaiah 7 verse 14, showing us that Jesus' birth is the fulfillment of a 700-year-old promise that a savior is gonna come and rescue his people from their sin. And so as you walk, doesn't it give you great confidence to know that you are walking side by side and hand in hand with the powerful promise keeper? The one who has promised to be with you, the one who has promised to protect you, the one who has promised to prepare you for heaven, persevere and provide for you physically, mentally and emotionally. You walk with a powerful promise keeper. And finally today, as you walk, you walk with a powerful promised Messiah. In this passage, Jesus, this miraculous child in Bethlehem, is given two beautiful names. In verse 21, the angel instructs Joseph to give him the name Jesus, which in Hebrew means God saves. And secondly, Isaiah declares his name to be Emmanuel, God with us. And so before you get confused or start thinking of those great 90s chorus songs by Amy Grodd of all the names of Jesus, my dad used to sing this continually. How should I, how should I, bloody bother, David, I. Anyone know this song? I don't even know the words, but all those names. Yes, praise God. El Shaddai, El Elyon, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shama, Ajababa, whatever all the names are. Anyway, here's the long and short of these names provided for God's Son. Firstly, the name Jesus is the description, listen, of what he does for you. Jesus is the description of what he does for you. That Jesus is your Savior. That Jesus has come to offer you mercy for judgment, healing for rebellion, grace for shame. He is your savior. He is your deliverer. He is your healer. He is your rescuer. Your savior has come to walk with you. That's who is walking with you. And then secondly, that savior has promised to be with you. Promised. No matter what, I am going to be with you. That's his second name, Emmanuel. It's the description of who he is. What he is, he's gonna save you. And who he is, he's gonna be with you. He is the one who sees you in your pain and chooses to enter into that hurt with you. He is the one who sees you in your suffering and chooses to walk that road with you. He is the Holy One who sees all of your sin, all of it, and chooses to endure with you and chooses to love you anyway. As you walk, you walk with a powerful promised keeper. And as you walk, you walk with a powerful promised Messiah. Friends, that's the message to those who believe this Christmas. And that's the invitation of Christmas to those who have yet to respond to Jesus. So as we begin to respond, Ben, you can come up as we close today. 
as we spend some time in worship now, to respond to these wonderful truths, I want you to take stock about what this passage is saying to us and saying to you in your walk with Jesus. Don't forget, firstly, that walking with God is going to require radical obedience, even in seasons when nothing makes sense. Secondly, walking with God is going to reveal His faithfulness. Maybe you think right now that God is withholding something that you deserve in this moment, when maybe right in this moment, He is doing the greatest work in you and preparing you for heaven. Walking with God will reveal His faithfulness, that His timing is perfect, and that He has a tendency of showing up in the middle of your mess. In the middle of your mess. And maybe you feel like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, I'm trusting you, but now I stand in the middle of this fire. So God, would you rescue me? But God, would you show me something greater today? That you are with me in the middle of this mess. That as you walk, you walk with the powerful promise keeper. And that as you walk, you walk with the powerful promised Messiah. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, this is the revelation of Christmas. Emmanuel, that God is with us. That His comfort is with us. As that video said before the sermon, a weary world can rejoice now. Because hope has come. God, forgive us in this moment for treasuring or craving comfort more than the counsel of a shepherd and the Savior of our soul. Today, you want us to let go of that desire to want everything our way and instead to embrace the fulfillment, the peace of the Prince of Peace. But we sing hallelujah today. Hallelujah, Christ, the Savior of the world, has come.